Hey everyone, Dr. Jake Gordy here, and today I'm going to be talking to you about TH1, TH2 mixed responses. So we've talked about how TH2 is really good at fighting parasites, TH1 is great at fighting viruses, um, but what are the mixed responses for? Do we have them? And uh, what do they do? So let's jump into that one. First, a bit of a background, uh, TH1. So TH1 is typified by the production of the two cytokines, IL-2, which causes T cell proliferation, in particular, cytotoxic T cells. And that's why it's antiviral, right? Sorry to cytotoxic T cells go around and kill cells whose MHC1 is displaying a viral protein or an intracellular bacteria antigen, right? So the, the cytotoxic T cells, they're cytotoxic, they go around killing cells that are infected. Um, interferon gamma is the other cytokine, the other Th1 cytokine. Now, almost all cells in your body have T interferon receptors, and when they're activated, they help stimulate antiviral genes within that cell. So they help prepare that cell for infection. One example is ZAP proteins, for example. And so ZAP proteins are turned on by interferon, and they recognize and bind to um, RNA the viral RNA, and they call, cause it, ultimately causing its degradation. So they can help a cell fight a viral infection. So they're called interferon because they interfere with viral life cycles. Um, so next we've got TH2. TH2 is famous for two main cytokines, IL-4 and IL-5. Um, IL-4 causes B cell proliferation and activation, and so that's antibody production, right? IL-4 is all about antibody production. IL-4 also primes basophils and mast cells, um, and IL-5 primes uh, eosinophils. Um, and so that's why it's good at the antiparasite response, right? Basophils and mast cells can cause uh, massive inflammation in, say, your gut, causing you to secrete a bunch of mucus, peristalsis, and you kick that pathogen out of your gut. Um, that parasite eosinophils contain neurotoxins, which kill the parasite. So that's why TH2 is antiparasite. So when we look at the responses, this is what we've got. TH1 um, on the left there, cytotoxic, good for antiviruses. TH2, antibodies and histamine. And we can kind of break it down to that. Viruses and intracellular pathogen, uh, pathogens over there, and intracellular bacteria and parasites. But hold on a minute. Didn't, didn't some doofus uh, tell me that antibodies are good at fighting viruses too? And that is 100% true, right? We want antibodies to fight viruses. Agglutination's great. Neutralization is great. So um, the functions of antibodies are excellent at fighting viruses. So we need some antibody production. And so we need perhaps a bit more of a mixed response in order to induce the optimal uh, antibody and cytotoxic T cell production. So we, we, we might draw up, a, a, we might draw up a, a map like this, and this is just a guide, but a general map where maybe the best spot for viruses and intracellular bacteria is somewhere over here, a bit of a mixed response is leaning towards a TH1 response. And then uh, maybe extracellular bacteria, um, because we don't really want cytotoxic T cells when the bacteria are extracellular, perhaps we want more of a TH2 response. Inflammation from basophils is good for bacteria. Um, and uh, antibodies are good for bacteria too, and also a TH17 response. That's a, that's on a different axis. Um, that's not on this continuum here, but also a TH17 response is excellent for fighting bacteria too. Um, and here's some hard evidence for this. So this is the World Health Organization, and uh, basically they've released a fantastic document on vaccines, and I highly recommend reading it, but it's very long. Uh, but it's a fantastic, fantastic sort of information for everyone so everyone can just take this document and have a good understanding about how to make vaccines work what are the good vaccines what do they do when do you give them so on and so forth and in this document they have a table and this table is basically uh, a measure for uh, what is the best correlation for the vaccine working right how do we what correlates with the vaccine working and if we look at a couple on that table there we can see if the influenza vaccine works, we should find IgG in their blood. Um, uh, so that's an antibody. That's more of a TH2 thing. And we also should find CD8 cytotoxic T cells in their blood too. So if the antibody worked, we should see CD8 cells and, and uh, IgG. Great example of wanting that balanced response. Same with measles there. We want both. And um, 
uh yeah so we can see there and mums for example here is just we want antibodies and actually cytotoxic t-cells doesn't correlate very well with vaccine success so you can see there that actually it's not as clean a story that th1 is antiviral and th2 is antiparasite we want often we want those mixed responses and those are the best indicators for whether we have mounted a successful attack against the virus or have we mounted a successful response to the vaccine so we're ready next time it comes along. Um, and this is what causes the uh, TH1. Again, this is incredibly simplified, guys. Um, but basically, you get PAMP detection there, pathogen-associated molecular pattern, for example, LPS on a TLR4, but it could be also viral RNA um, on TLR7, for example, inside your phagosomes. Um, so you get PAMP detection. This causes inflammation in the antigen presenting cell. This could be a macrophage up the top there, and it will release IL-12. Um, and IL-12 will uh, tell the T helper cell, who's recognized this antigen on the MAC2 molecule there, to become a TH1. Um, over there, we've got a TH2 response, and TH2 responses are kind of complicated. It's dose dependent on the PAMPs there, so if you get too much pathogen-associated molecular pattern, you're going to probably end up with more of a TH1 response than a TH2 response. But an example is, for example, mucus from a worm activating TLR2 and the mannose receptor simultaneously, and that can cause IL-4 to be produced from the macrophage. But also low-dose PAMPs. There's a number of other things. This was just an example for the parasite response. So how do we get this extra response in a vaccine, right? Sometimes a vaccine, for example, the new Pfizer vaccines and the Moderna vaccines, they are purely RNA vaccines, so they will cause the production of a pure spike protein. So where is this pathogen-associated molecular pattern in this response there? Um, are we getting that, that other response from the antigen-presenting cell that we want to happen, or are we just getting antigen presentation? And that's when adjuvants come along. Now, adjuvants are something we add to the vaccine beyond the um, beyond the pathogen associated beyond the antigen. Beyond the antigen, we need a adjuvant. Oh, this is getting complicated. So the, we want, for example, SARS-CoV-2. We want a vaccine where the body will respond to the spike protein, right? So we might create a vaccine, and Australia did try to do this. They created a vaccine that contained um, pure spike protein to inject, right? So we create a vaccine to contain pure spike protein, but we're not getting that second signal going on there. We're not getting uh, this signal here or this signal here to um, really amplify up a TH1 or TH2 response. So what we need to do beyond the antigen, which would be the spike protein in this example, beyond the antigen in the vaccine, we need something else there to stimulate the cytokine release from the antigen presenting cells, from the macrophages and dendritic cells to really steer the T helper cell response into a mixed TH1, TH2 response, right? So um, in vaccines, we add other stimulants to stimulate the innate immune response, and these are called adjuvants. Um, so we've just got some examples there. Um, uh, there are TLR7 agonists, for example, that are currently in clinical trials adjuvants. Um, over here, there are TLR4 adjuvants that are going in, and um, uh, or PolyIC is a clinical trial for adjuvants, or alum, which is an uh, aluminium crystal that will poke holes in cells and cause IL-1 release. Um, so uh, there are these other stimulants that go into the vaccine to stimulate that innate immune response. Some vaccines that are just killed bacteria already have that in there, right? They already have uh, parts of the cell wall from the bacteria that might be recognized by TLR4. So they've already got the pathogen associated molecular patterns if it's just a dead, um, if it's a dead bacteria. For example, the Chinese virus is actually just a killed, the, the Chinese vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 is actually just a killed virus. So it's just killed SARS-CoV-2. Um, that's got the uh, envelope, that's got the spike proteins, that's got the um, loose uh, RNA just floating around, and so maybe it doesn't need an adjuvant. They often will put an adjuvant in there to extra stimulate the response of the innate immune system in there, but if it's just killed pathogen, sometimes they don't need it. 
but if it's a pure a vaccine that contains just a protein or maybe it's a vaccine that just contains mRNA perhaps they will need that adjuvant in there to extra stimulate the immune system so we, we have to get this right we have to get the adjuvants or PEMPs right to get the right combination of TH1 and TH2 response and an example might be if we put in too much adjuvant or perhaps too much vaccine if it's a dead uh, virus or bacteria um, we might steer it to a TH1 response. We might point it towards an inflammatory response and that inflammation causes that TH1 uh, type response rather than getting that mixed response that we want. So we've got to choose our adjuvants wisely. We want to make sure that we get, we're going to choose our adjuvants and we've got to choose our dose of the vaccine wisely to get the best spot. Um, for this mixed TH1, TH2 response. Right, so up next, that was a great intro because it's really going to be important for our understanding of this AstraZeneca vaccine clinical trial, which I'm going to take you through in other videos and up and coming.